Hey guys, uh, it's Rocco here. We're in London at Bloomsbury Hotel. I cannot wait to see our next guest, Dr. Demartini. Stay tuned and follow me. If I'm really honest with myself, I realize that I distort my reality often by subjective biases, and therefore I'm lying about reality many times. So to be honest is some way a proud, narrow-minding state to think that you're only one side. So I, I, I found that that's uh, not a very wise thing to do to try to be a one-sided person. Is that whatever we see in others is a reflection of us, even though we don't want to admit it and we're too proud or too humble to admit it many times. I've, I've figured out a way, the method, on how to dissolve whatever somebody calls a stress. Any form of stress, we can, we can dissolve it. Dr. Martini, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Um, I'm so excited because uh, we spent a weekend together at the Breakthrough um, I can, uh, seminar workshop. Um, for me, it was uh, an awareness of my uh, spirituality, my physicality. It was something that I cannot put in words, um, which I would love you to help me <laughs> say that to people of how can I word what I experienced uh, that weekend. Um, who's John Demartini? Who is John Demartini? <laughs> um, I'm a man on a mission who travels the world full time, uh, researching and teaching on helping people maximize their human potential, their human awareness and potential, and helping whatever way I can to help the people live more inspired, magnificent, and amazing lives. So I full-time do that. I've been doing that. I've been teaching for 46 years. And um, I'm also a retired chiropractor. <clears throat> I did that while I was teaching. I was doing that also. And um, that's actually the avenue in which I began my speaking career was primarily in the health fields. Chiropract oh, health. Chiropractic and health fields. So you always wanted to help people? I wanted to be a teacher, healer, and philosopher since I was 17. Highest values. That was, that was my highest thing. Today it's researching, writing, traveling, and teaching. How did the value factor came up? One of my milestone books. <clears throat> the values factor book that was published by Penguin, um, <clears throat> distilling the greatest ideas that I was able to gather made me realize that every human being lives by a set of priorities, a set of values, things that are most to least important in their life. And every perception, every decision, and every action that a human being takes is based on what they value most. And they filter their reality according to what they value. They evaluate their reality according to their values. And knowing what's highest on their value is where they excel, where they spontaneously are inspired to take action, and where they expand themselves the most and give themselves permission to do the most amazing things. And in their lower values, which are more extrinsically driven, they require motivation to get them to move. And I watch people that require motivation are different than people who are inspired from within. So the hierarchy of values that a person has dictates their destiny. So I wrote The Values Factor uh, to try to awaken people to the realization of how important those values are, because many people bang their head against the wall pursuing goals or objectives that aren't really theirs. They're, they're subordinating to other people's influence and confusing and clouding what's clear in their mind and their heart about what they really want to do and trying to be second at something instead of being first at being themselves. Comparing themselves to other people? Yeah, they're, other they're, ideas. they're comparing themselves to other people instead of comparing their daily actions to their own highest values. And they're living in the shadows of others with conformity instead of standing on the shoulders of giants with enormity. That's, that's what actually was a breakthrough to me because you put context on everything you were saying and that was my other question that, a question to myself that, my, what, what's my value? Like I, I sat down and was like when we 
did the exercise, I was like, what's, what, what's my values? And you, you said that it's what you do every day and time disappears, right? Yeah, what, you know, when people are asked, I mean, I've been working with human values for over 40 years. And people, when I ask them, what are your values, just out of curiosity, 90 plus percent will tell you what they think it should be, ought to be, supposed to be, got to be, have to be, what's convention, tradition, or, or something from external sources, mother, father, preacher, teacher, or something. And they don't actually look within and look at what their life actually demonstrates. So I, I created a series of value determinants that are a little bit more objective than that by looking at how people fill their space, how they really spend their time, uh, what they're really energized by, what is it they spend their money on, where are they most organized, where they're most disciplined, what do they think about, visualize, and internally dialogue to themselves about most, about how they want their life that's showing evidence of coming true, what they want to converse and talk to other people about most, what inspires them most, what are the most consistent, persistent goals that are actually being achieved, and what is it that they love studying about spontaneously? If they look at that, the answer to those questions, it narrows down to something that stands out and it's like, wow, this is what my life is really about. I never really looked. And that's what shows up spontaneous in their life. And I'm interested in finding a spontaneous, intrinsically driven uh, drive for people. So they don't require outside motivations and not have intermittent frust frustrations in their life. And people who find that do extraordinary things. So I've been helping people do that for many, many years, decades, in fact. Oh, yeah. And we saw <coughs> that also doing it like I saw it live on that weekend we spent together. And uh, I saw it myself. Um, and what was, what was a bit hurting is I'm 36 now. And I was like, why didn't I know all this like 15 years ago? And I think the, the, the next person that I should do the, your method is on myself. Because um, what was really, you always say that when there are always negatives and positives, right, in life. Well, there's, every event bursts a pair of opposites. And if we choose to see one side and become conscious of one side and unconscious of the other, we divide our full consciousness up into, into halves and we judge. And then what happens is those things we judge run us because the things we're infatuated with occupy space and time in our mind and run us. And the things we resent occupy space and time in our mind and run us. And only when we see fully what's there and we're poised and present with that, we are fully conscious and we get to run ourselves. And so I'm attempting to help people find out what's really meaningful to them so they can run their own life and decide how they want their life. Because nobody's going to get up in the morning and dedicate their life to your fulfillment other than you. And if you're not doing it, you're going to end up subordinating to the world around you and nobody's committed to your fulfillment. So you're going to end up dim diminishing and diluting the potential and the fulfillment you have in life trying to do that. So if I'm, <clears throat> all my decisions are based on the outcome that um, everything is equally negative and positive. Somebody might say, because I heard that question, what would I try? Hmm. I get that question. Well, Every time you're in a state of judgment, you're assuming and perceiving um, that there's more advantages and disadvantages and you're making a decision accordingly, trying to avoid some sort of predator and seek some sort of prey association. But at the moment you actually have a poise state, which you may remember from the breakthrough experience this weekend, you now don't react from a decision, you act out of a calling of love for something that inspires you. And the majority of people on the planet don't even know what that's like. They, they, don't, they live with decisions and they're, they're, they're having stress all the time, fearing the loss of that which they're seeking and fearing the gain of that which they're trying to avoid. And they're doing assessments, evaluations with incomplete knowledge and don't know what it's like to actually have a calling of inspiration from within to make you act in a prioritized way, in a way that's highly fulfilling. And so when I introduce that to people, they go, whoa, I've never, that's new to me. And they didn't realize it's even available. It was for me too. Yeah. So how, how can you see clearly in a, in a place in the world that is trying to change you to be actually not you? Well, many philosophers through the ages have made reference to the idea of being willing to stand out instead of fit in. Yeah. And have your individuality 
your undivided part of you. Because otherwise you're divided. And to honor that, Emerson said, envy is ignorance and imitation is suicide. suicide. And Einstein said, my contempt for authority made me one. Instead of abiding by authority and minimizing self, he became the authority. And yeah. people become the author of their own life, which is an authority, when they live authentically and they lose their authorship over their own life when they subordinate. Conformity, the, the, people are sometimes looking for heroes and they think it's out there. And with every hero, there's a villain. And so they're run by the outer world of avoiding the villain and seeking the hero. And they're basically hero worshiping. And then as you can see, many today, the people that were thought to be heroes had a hidden villain. Yep. The real truth is that there is no hero or villain out there. There's always a person that has a pair of opposites that include both. And um, I'm not a nice person or a mean person. I'm a synthesis of that. And I'm a hero villain. And when you finally realize that that is what you are, you give yourself permission to honor that and not have to get rid of half of yourself or try to be only one side of yourself because that's futile. But to embrace both sides of yourself. People want to be loved and appreciated for both sides. And you have the power, that's why I teach in the break experience, to be in love with both sides of yourself and not have to get rid of half of yourself. That's why the self-improvement industry, although a large industry, can be misleading because it makes people think, well, I need to get rid of this bad part and get only this so-called good part. But if you look really honestly at yourself, you realize you never got rid of any parts. Oh, you haven't. And you have it all still and you, and you don't need to get rid of any part and all of it is necessary. That creates guilt. Striving for a one-sided system creates pride and shame. Exactly, guilt. And always you feel, uh, we can say that it causes depression, it causes anxiety, because you're seeking for a fantasy. Well, the, the Buddhist construct was uh, the desire for that which is unavailable. Now imagine a magnet here, and you got a positive pole and a negative, negative pole, and you're trying to cut the magnet in half and get only the positive pole. Can't do it. So d desire for that which is unavailable, the positive pole, and the desire to avoid that which is the negative part, the unavoidable, so, is a source of human suffering. So I don't try to get rid of any of the part. I just say, if you want magnetism, you got to embrace the full magnet. And then you have a magnetism to attract into your life what you want. Excellent. And you said positive. It's a good segue for me to ask something which I might know you and knows me. Positive thinking versus what I uh, we talked before, the gratitude effect. People say, if I, if, um, I need 10 things a day to be, you know, feel good that I have them, I own them, right? And then you've got people saying that's positive thinking. But is it? What's positive thinking? Well, you can put a positive spin or a negative spin on anything. If, uh, if, you, if you're married, you know that your spouse will easily both support and challenge you at times. And so she's seeing you when you're supporting her values in a positive light and when you're challenging your values in a negative light. But if you look carefully, sometimes the things that you think are negative actually serve you and the things that are positive actually can hinder you. You know, if, if, if you're overly supportive and protective of a child, you can make it juvenile dependent. Yeah. And if you're over-challenging it, it might become precocious independent. If you want to make somebody work for somebody else, over-support them. If you want them to become entrepreneurs, challenge them. So that what is thought to be mean is nice, and whatever you thought is nice can be mean, and they're inseparable. That's why the idea of labeling something nice and mean or positive and negative or is, is really a sign of a narrowed mind and not a complete awareness. So in life, uh, striving to get a one-sided state is not going to be obtainable. I have no desire to be one-sided. I did in my 20s because I wasn't aware enough to see that. And I hadn't had enough experience to realize that I never did get rid of any of these things I've been trying to get rid of. They keep surfacing. And I realized that, that me striving for a one-sided thing was actually the source of it. Me trying to be positive all the time and then having an unrealistic expectation Created would it. make me negative and depressed because I had a false construct. I always say depression is a comparison of your current reality to a fantasy that you're addicted to. If I'm really honest with myself, I realize that I distort my reality often by subjective biases, and therefore I'm lying about reality many times. So to be honest is some way a proud, narrow-minding state to think that you're only one side. So I, I, I found that that's uh, not a very wise thing to do to try to be a one-sided person. And, and some moralists that are absolutists try to promote something like that, but it becomes hypocrisy 
and they eventually get caught in their trap. Well, so we I see it every day. I, yeah, so I just I realized that everything has its place. I think it was the Ecclesiastes three in, in the biblical writings, Old Testament. It says there's a time for peace, a time for war, a time for sowing, a time for renting, a time for all things under the sun. I think that that includes all our behaviors. And people go, well, wait a minute now, what would the world end up being if it was that way? Well, so far with all the moralities that we've had, we haven't got rid of any traits. <laughs> so imposing an artificial ideal Offense. doesn't necessarily mean it changes the behaviors. And you said owning our traits. Yeah. How? Well, the way you do it is by... The way I did it, that I found the most productive way, was to go through an Oxford Dictionary, the big, thin paper, large dictionary. Okay, yeah. And um, I just started going through page by page, because it was the biggest dictionary I could find. And I went through and identified and circled every trait or behavioral activity that a human being I could find in that book. So I'd go through there, and about every 20 or so, 30 words, I'd get one, I'd circle, that's a human behavior, mean, nice, cruel, kind, honest, dishonest. How many words did you get to? 4,628, I count. And in the process of getting those traits, I then wrote out the names of the people who I had known personally or knew of that were the most extreme examples of that behavior. That owned the trait? That, well, that I saw in that, that behavior. Okay. That, I saw that behavior in them. Okay. And I wrote their name out there. And then I looked and I realized that whatever we see in others is a reflection of us even though we don't want to admit it and we're too proud or too humble to admit it many times. And so I looked and I looked, okay, where, when have I displayed that? When, when did I do that? And I found that I had done it and I kept doing, looking at where I did it, where I did it, where I did it until I could identify where I've done it as much as I saw in them. And I used to do that with my people in Breakthrough and just do nothing but that, a hundred of those for everybody in the Breakthrough. Make people do that to make them realize that what we judge in others is us, to make them really get that. And, uh, that was very eye-opening because I had every trait, all 4,628 traits. But in that way, you level up whoever you look up to. The people you once looked up to or down on, they, instead of having them on pedestals or pits, now they're now in your heart. And you're really growing, huh? You realize you have them and you realize that they're, there's, who, who am I to judge them? You know, I, I, I get that, you know, people come into the break too every weekend with quite a bit of, uh, I guess you could say, arrogance about, about people, people that they're judging. judging. And, and sometimes, sometimes they look and, I, and they swear, no, I would never do that. I pride myself in not being that way. Oh, no, 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 I couldn't do it. Never do it. Never hurt somebody like that. And then when they go digging and get honest and get past their facade, they discover things and it really humbles them. And they make them realize that, oh, I'm resenting this person because they're reminding me of stuff inside me that I'm feeling guilty about. And, and then it gives them now in the breakthrough, that gives them the opportunity with the method to dissolve their shame or guilt and dissolve their resentment. And then they realize that, oh, we're human beings and it's time for us to not project our evaluations onto other people and expect them to live in our values, which is skewed, and we're, we're hypocrites in that respect. And, and people even hearing this will probably go, well, not me, but I, I dare them to come to the breakthrough experience and I dare them to go through the exercise. I guarantee they'll discover that they have what they see in others. How can I explain, in words, what I just went through this weekend? <laughs> That's a hard one, because uh, I've been doing the Breakthrough Experience for over 30 years now. And no matter what, it's not easy to describe what that experience is. I had to call it an experience, because it's an experience. And people go there and they go, they, they come out of there and go, now I know why you had a hard time explaining it, because it's what you see and what you experience is not typically something your brain registers and identifies and puts words on. Yeah, so. that's, that's why I always say, come get to that weekend, book it, and you translate it in any way you want, because it's, it's a wonderful experience. Yeah, I, I mean, I've heard all kinds of things, and, and it's been numerous, because everybody brings to the table different needs. Uh, I had a six, seven-year-old girl there that uh, desired to be a speaker, and a year later she had a first book out a year later, she had her second book out, and then three years later, she had her third book out. And so from a six, seven, eight-year-old's perspective, 10, 12-year-old perspective now, which she just was recently there again at 12, and um, her perspective is that this was the beginning of her being clear about what she wanted to do. So the breakthrough experience helped her get clear on what she believed her mission was so she could build momentum at a very young age. And That's when incredible. she got clear on it, a lot of the behaviors of eating sweets 
and uh, watching TV and things that are normally as less productive for some people, she stopped because she now got a clear mission of what she wanted to do and started writing and started reading and started focusing and started interviewing people. And she became the deputy mayor of Melbourne, Australia at age 12. So it's amazing what you can do if you give yourself permission to go for it. But I've seen people at all different ages come in for all different reasons. And some people have business issues they want to solve and break through plateaus on. Some people have uh, social issues that they're angry at people. Some people have family issues, some health issues. I don't know what they're going to bring. I just know that the tools that are presented there have application in all of the areas of life. And there's a solution for pretty well anything that they bring. I've, I've figured out a way, the method on how to dissolve whatever somebody calls a stress. Any form of stress, we can, we can dissolve it. And Maslow used to say, if you only have a hammer, all your problems are nails. But I wouldn't say you bring a, a new tool, you bring a new toolbox with anything. That's how I felt. So for everything, either emotional, spiritual, familiar, uh, business, uh, had to do with spirituality, anything, you can take, open the toolbox well, th and get this, this particular methodology that I developed is has wide application. We call it a, a tool with a thousand uses because we've seen literally a thousand different issues that people have addressed, neutralized and solved with that one tool. And at first people go, oh, that sounds kind of like hype and craziness. It's not. At Keio University in Japan, there's a lovely professor, two professors there, that uh, heard uh, when, when the tsunami came in Japan back in 2000, whatever it was, 11, I think. Yeah. Um, after it had happened, right after it happened, uh, we were asked to come in and help the people go through that and, and uh, process that of grief. Grief. Or, okay, yeah. grief. So I had a, a town hall meeting and I was taken through the grief process. And then about a year ago, we had them do after the earthquake that hit, we were called in again. And so Professor Mena says, you know, we hear about this, this method you developed and we, you cleared all these people's griefs and you did it in, in time that never heard of before. You know, what is this? And he decided to do pilot study, and we've now passed that, and they're doing the, the write-up on it. And um, he said, this is revolutionary. And I said, I know. <laughs> I figured out what the source of this is, and I know what to do with it now. And you saw it live. Oh, God, that was... It was it's quite amazing to watch. It, yeah. And it's hard to put in words, because you, you can't imagine somebody would even think of being able to do that. But <sighs> what happens is we're able to take somebody who's having grief, for instance, over a loss, whether it had been years or weeks or days or hours, and dissolve it. And, and and you go, well, why? Isn't that normal to do that? You're supposed to grieve. Absolutely not. It's actually unhealthy. And and it's an animal behavior, but it's not necessarily having to be a human behavior. So I figured out what the source of the grief is and how to dissolve it. And I've got a science now and I can duplicate that. And they're doing studies on it. And I already know the outcome of the study. I'm letting them find out what the outcome is. Because I've been doing it on 3,573 people since 1984. So I already know the results. Watched them long term. What I was a bit um, skeptic when it finished. I'm like, okay, maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes. It was after five hours that that woman completely changed her whole behavior, uh, face changed, body, uh, body language. You can talk to her a week from now, a month from now, a quarter from now, a year from now. It doesn't matter how long. That Actually, that perception is not going to be bad. It helped me watching her for, you know, personal issues. You're like, yes. I, 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 I get that, and it's well, incredible. Well, there's a profound, there's, there's truly a profound magnificence inside human beings. And I said at the beginning of the breakthrough, I said that I'm going to help you. It's not a self-improvement course. It's yeah. about a realization about your magnificence. And there is a profound magnificence in people and a magnificence in the world. But we've had so many labels that have moralized it and absolutized it that we've missed out on that magnificence. And Leibniz said in his uh, Discourse on Metaphysics, the few people that get to get, get a glimpse of that magnificence, their lives are changed forever. And that's been my dream, to be able to give people a glimpse yes. of the magnificence. Breaks is about accessing a glimpse of the magnificence, the hidden order in their apparent chaos, and to learn a new science of asking questions, to reveal your unconscious awareness, to have full consciousness, to see this magnificence. And there's a lot of things that... Uh, People don't even realize that they're stored in their subconscious mind that are just baggage, that all dissolvable. And, and, it's, and it's, it's very rewarding to be able to say thank you, I love you to yourself. And a lot of people have not said that their whole life. You said unconscious. 
What world is that? And what's conscious? Well, if you infatuate with somebody, you're blind to the downsides. If you resent somebody, you're blind to the upsides. Whatever you're blind to, you're unconscious of. And then all of the unconscious and conscious splits from all the judgments we have are stored in what we could call the subconscious mind. And they're running us without us even being aware of it. They're just running our behaviors through associations and remindings and our anxieties and our fantasies. Is that dopamine used against us in a way? Mm -hmm. Dopamine? Well, dopamine is on the fantasy side, and there's other substances, uh, histamine and, and um, uh, you know, cortisol and things are on the side that we're challenged by, fight or flight side. But those associations make us automatons reacting, thinking we have free will, but actually we've already made the movement in our muscles 200 to 800 milliseconds before we were in conscious we actually are going to do something. And so we, we can actually trace that and show that most people are automatons reacting to previous stored emotional charges that they've never neutralized and seen the wholeness of. And the breakthrough experience and the method returns you to see the magnificence so you act, not react. Yeah. What I find hard, I've been in the industry of health and fitness for the past 18 years, and what I find hard is not the plan or the strategy to create a change either for uh, diet, training, physical activity, is the adherence. And my question is, is our biology blocking our values or values blocking our biology when you have, for example, a woman that you know that her second menstrual, uh, part of her menstrual cycle, she will have cravings, her whole biology is working against her and she wants to eat everything, for example. Is that what's what's going You know what? Well, I'll share a story. <clears throat> I'll just share a story because it may be applicable. Uh, my experience is that every decision a human being makes, a decision, again, is based on a judgment. Every decision that a person makes is based on what they believe in that moment will give them more advantage and disadvantage, or they wouldn't do it. Okay. And so I had a, a, a reality TV show that they were filming in Los Angeles at Universal Studios. And there was a, a lady, they asked me to transform 12 people's lives uh, in two hours each. So I had 24 hours to transform 12 people's lives. And uh, one of the ladies came in uh, with a giant box with another box on top of it of food when she walked in. And she was a very large woman. And she walked in, she says, I brought everybody food in case you're hungry. And then nobody ate it except her. I mean, she was just grazing eating this food. And, and she ate more while we were doing the interactions than I probably would eat nearly in a week. Oh, wow. It was, it was amazing how much food was packed. And she said, oh, Dr. Martini, you've got to help me. I, I can't, i got to stop this eating. You've got to help me. I've got this problem. And I'm thinking, you got to... And the first question I asked her, I said, what's the benefit you're getting out of eating? You wouldn't be doing it if you weren't getting a benefit. It's all strategic. So what's the benefit you're getting out of it? And so it's not, it's not, it's hurting me. Look, it's not helping me. How, how could it be helping me? And I, I said, stop. Stop writing the story. And just answer the question. What's the benefit you're getting out of eating? You would not be doing it if you weren't getting some benefit. And she stopped and realized that I caught her in her, in her game. And she said, popped in her head, she says, everybody in my family is large. Okay. Everybody's large. If I'm not large, I don't feel like I'm part of my family. I thought, wow, that's an interesting thing. What else? I asked. My sister's very big, and she used to push me around and used to literally hit me. And I swore I would never be smaller than my sister. I'm always going to be bigger than her, so she can't push me around. I went, whoa, that's good, too. Let's go to the third one. What's the next one? And then all of a sudden, tears came out of her eyes. And she said, wow, I can't believe this, is, this just came up. I went on a crash diet and lost like 45 pounds. And I started to actually have a little bit of a shape the first time in my entire life. And a guy attracted, was attracted to me and started kind of flirting with me. And I had never been with a guy. And I thought this guy really, it was magical. And I was infatuated. And I was, you know, open. And he was kind of assertive. And we made love the first time. The first time we ever got together, I never had that experience. And the next day, he disappeared and never seen again. 
and a number of weeks later, I found out I was pregnant and I have a Catholic background. And I'm going, I'm now trapped. I don't want to have a baby with somebody that I don't even know. I have no husband. And because of that guilt, and I also don't want to have an abortion. And I have that guilt. And so she was in major turmoil over this. And she eventually decided I'm going to have an abortion. And that made her feel guilty and thinking she was going to go to hell or something, which is her belief that she had injected from some authority. And um, what's interesting is she had so much pain associated with losing weight and being vulnerable that she unconsciously made sure she never did that again. And so even if she goes on a crash diet, her metabolism slows down to make sure she doesn't lose weight because of this unconscious strategies that's sitting here, this unconscious motive, if you will. Anyway, we kept going through all the benefits. Another benefit, she said that uh, if I was to lose weight, my skin sags, and then I look, you know, I don't look well. And people always admire my skin because it's so smooth, because it's so puffed up and stretched. And she says, so I am leery about losing weight because I notice that my body sags, my face sags, my arms sag, and something no else. Benefits, actually. So uh, that's too scary for me. And I don't want to have surgery to, to remove all the, the thing. So and I put all the benefits, and I made her do 150 benefits. I made her look. And she uncovered them, and they started coming up, and they brought tears to her eyes. And then she finally, she said, unless I have viable alternative ways of getting these benefits without eating and keeping weight on I'm probably going to do this, aren't I? I said, you got it. Now you know why you've been doing this for the last 38 years. And I said, so wow. you never do something without a motive, but you may not be conscious of it. And helping people uncover that unconscious motive is very revealing, very inspiring for people. People say, I want to be financially independent, but then they immediately spend money on consumables that depreciate in value. Because their real value is the lifestyle of the rich and famous as soon as possible not putting your money into assets that grow in value over time with patience. So as long as they don't have that value, they're not going to get ahead. They're going to be working as a slave for money instead of a master of money. And that's a good segue to, I want it yesterday, I want it now. I'm not seeing any results. Well, immediate gratification is often an unrealistic fantasy. And that's the importance of finding, either as me as a practitioner or as an individual for my own self or for my patients or clients, the importance of finding their highest value and trying to link. If you take the action steps that have proven to be helpful um, in diet, in exercise, in mannerisms to help health, well-being, activities that are health-oriented, wealth, wellness-oriented, if you access, make a list of those and link those to what's highest on the person's values and ask, how is doing this activity going to help them get what they want? The more the links you make, the more they spontaneously do the actions that lead them to wellness. So you link everything to the highest I link value. to what's highest in their values, and I stack up the benefits of doing those things. And if I stack up enough benefits, when the why is big enough, the house take care of themselves. And if there's more advantages than the alternatives, they'll begin to do it. But to expect somebody to do it is to impose a false guilt-generating system, which then makes them even want to go further into the opposite path. So you can't impose on people your values and what's right and what should and those kind of things. You have to honor the person, find out what their real values are, and link wise actions to that. Or not encourage them to set fantasies that aren't really matching their values. A lot of people are doing that. They're subordinating to other people to think, oh, I should be that way. Anytime you hear yourself saying, I should, I ought to, I suppose to, I got to, I have to, I must, it's not you talking. It's an injected value of some authority you've given power to. And knowing the distinction between what's really you, what's really a calling, what you're spontaneously doing, and the things that you procrastinate on but think you should be doing, those aren't really your highest values. It's incredible how, you, um, how you're trying to connect everything to highest values because it's, it's when you, awareness starts, but it's how can you keep that there because you can have different positives and negatives, the pair, while you went through that challenge and you can have new challenges coming in, negative, positive. Well, when you're living by your highest values, you have the greatest resilience because you have the most objectivity. I use the example in the breakthrough experience when a boy is loving his video games. Uh, he spontaneously beats the video game. He works and beats it. And then he wants to go to a more advanced game. So when you're living by your highest values, you're pursuing challenges that inspire you. So the positive and negative is more balanced and more objective. When you're doing things that are low on your values, that are uninspiring, you look for me to gratification, and you want a pleasure, and you want to avoid a pain. So anytime a person is living in lower values or attempting to, because they're subordinating to other people and trying to be somebody they're not, they automatically are going to have a smaller time frame. 
And immediate gratification, compulsive, addictive, impulsive behaviors are byproducts of unfulfilled highest values. So prioritizing their life and getting them onto what's most important allows them to be more resilient, more adaptable. No matter what vicissitudes that happen in their life, they end up managing it. And they become great leaders and managers that way. And that's what all Breakthrough was about, about optimizing your human awareness, regarding to the magnitude of your potential. And that's it. And the person who's able to see both sides is able to transcend the emotional reactions that most people get caught in, which has been called the Peter Principle. People keep get promoted to the level of incompetence, and the incompetence is the point, moment you get where you are either infatuated or resentful to something, and you're impulsive or instinctual to and fro. And now you have an emotion of source, attract or repel instead of a poised state where you're pursuing what's inspiring to you, not out of a, a, a avoidance or a seeking, but out of a calling. That could be an excuse, though, for some people that have, because uh, what you went through, and I'm, I'm planning to uh, go on your prophecy to a uh, five-day course, right, yeah. about illness. Because people say, you know what, this came, I'm, I'm a terminal ill, or I've got cancer, or I've got this. And you put it in that context that you seriously, um, for me, it was just, it was incredible because I didn't think about how you correlated leukemia, for example, with um, a problem with women. women. Um, and for me, that was like, I still cannot grasp the, <laughs> the whole. Well, there is not an absolute law here, but what it is is you have the potential tendencies for certain behaviors and certain illnesses coming from certain perceptions and actions. So you don't want to just say, that's what it is. You go sure, and guide yeah. and then you put the puzzle together. No one thing is diagnostic, as they say. But what happens is uh, the red blood cells and the white blood cells, uh, the red blood cells mainly for oxygeniz oxygenization and is oxidizing and is for the daytime to tackle the challenges, etc. Today we live in a 24-hour day, so the circadian rhythms yes. and the chronobiology is a little different. But um, you know, at night, we're more resting and more, one, one's more sympathetic, one's more parasympathetic. One's more testosterone more to tackle estrogen. the challenges, one's estrogen. more estrogen to rebuild. One's anabolic at night and one's more catabolic during the day. Well, the red blood cells are there and they are for oxygen. The other ones are there for rebuilding and repairing and, and protecting. So it's like a sleep mechanism. And so those are more active. If you look at the circadian rhythms of the immune system, you can see that. But whenever you have a heightened white blood cell count or a lower you know, leuco leuco leukocytopenia or leukemia, uh, too low or too high, or uh, anemia, which is too low, or polycythemia, too high, you're dealing with a, a, a testosterone or estrogen masculine or feminine aspect. So it's not really way out there. It's actually just basically applied physiology. What I did is I took every cell in the body, I took the autonomic influence on it, and I took each of the receptors, the transmitters, and I just put, went through there and analyzed them, and then looked at what it is that actually changes the races of hormones. I came across a book called Hormones in the Brain many, many years ago, nearly 40. And uh, in this, this, this text, it literally, what they did is they took a series of psychiatric patients with different diagnosed psychiatric states and they looked at the titers of 37 hormones and transmitters and they found these patterns and then they thought, okay, let's do an experiment. Uh, here's a pattern that occurs under this condition, this psychiatric condition. If we go in there and inject those titers and get that blood up to those levels, will they behave that way? And they found that some of the behaviors were surfacing when they changed the ratios of these chemistries. And so I, I, I was interested in that. I was going, well, if the change in chemistry does that, and the change of that changes the chemistry, there's a two-way street. And then I thought, okay, I've also worked with people that have some of these psychiatric conditions, but I've never approached it from a biochemical side, because that, that means that they don't have the power, the pharmaceutical has the power. True. And so I thought, I'm going to come up with a final a way where I give people back their power. Because I realized that your perceptions changes your transmitters. So I started doing correlations between transmitters, hormones, and perceptions. And I can take somebody who's got a low testosterone, and I can change perceptions by asking questions and make them consciously aware of things and watch the testosterone go up, or the estrogen go up and down. Because I learned that when, when, you're, when you're a mother, let's say, has just given birth, 
and she's relaxed and doesn't have any stress, doesn't have to do anything and be there nurturing it, the estrogen's up. But if all of a sudden she has to go to work and take care of things and she's stressed, the testosterone goes up, estrogen can drop. And that can influence the child and influence her response and her behavior. Uh, so I, I realize that perceptions are, are changing these transmitters and leading to these conditions. And I also notice that some perceptions are stored in the subconscious mind and are not dissolved and neutralized, and they eventually cat catalyze these illnesses. And so I was interested in trying to give people their power back and giving them a tool that they could re redo their perceptions, change their chemistries, change their epigenetic impact, and, and hopefully restore their life. And in, over the last 30-something years, I've had lots and thousands and thousands of cases of people that had changes in physiology as a result of changes in perceptions. So the mind-body connection, I've, I've been involved in for many, many years. And we can, where we can find this information? Well, I presented in some of my programs. I have a five-day program called the Prophecy 2 Experience, okay. where you, the prophecy is basically you become a prophet of your own destiny. How you perceive your world becomes your, how you live. And it's basically a thousand health conditions and the endocrinology, the neurology, the physiology, uh, the psychology, the pathology of those conditions. And what are the psychologicals? And then the orthodox and also the, the alternatives and then my also method on what to do with it. So it's like a textbook. Wow. I'm signing up for that for sure. Last question because I know you're a really, really busy man. People usually ask, I want to be successful. Why am I not successful? <laughs> That's the, the question. You, you, I mentioned that story, I think. Yeah. Okay, I'll tell the story again. Um, I had a gentleman who was a doctor who came to me and said, Dr. Demartini, I, I would like for you to help me become successful. And I said, great. And uh, he said, so what do we do? I said, so where are you successful? And he looked at me with a puzzle and a fuzzing face and he goes, but I'm not. I want to be successful. And I said, uh, so where are you successful? He said, Dr. Martini, I'm not getting myself clear. I'm not. I want to be successful. I said, I'm not making myself clear. You need to answer my question, and I'll help you. Where are you successful? And he goes, but I'm not. And I said, well, my certainty exceeds your doubt. I need you to go looking because you're not looking in the right place. Let's look. Where are you successful? Where are you actually accomplishing things you set out to do that are meaningful, that are inspiring to you, that are important to you? Oh. Well, I have an amazing relationship with my wife. She's, we've been married 10 years, and it's beautiful. And we really, compared to a lot of people, we have this amazing relationship. I said, okay, so you would acknowledge that you have an achievement there that's quite fulfilling and it's a, quote, success. He goes, yes. And I have a son who's in baseball, and I'm kind of the coach, and we look like we're going to win the pennant this year. And so that's pretty cool. That's a success. What else? Well, we have this beautiful yard, and the whole family works in the yard, and it's full of flowers and things like that, and I think we're going to we're, get the yard of the month, and that's important to all the family. And what else? Well, the mother-in-law lives with us, and most of us don't want to, you know, most people don't want to have their mother-in-law live with them, but we have this amazing relationship, and she's like, fits right in, and just perfect for the family. And I think that's pretty successful. That's very rare. Where else is successful? Well, I do, on Wednesdays and Sundays, I do uh, church services, and I'm actually one of the ministers, and that's something I've been wanting to do since my 20, and I guess I'm achieving that. And I said, can you see that you have a series of successes? He goes, okay. I said, the only reason you think you're not successful is because you're comparing yourself to somebody else. So who are you comparing yourself to? He says, I think I know. He says, there's a dock up on top of the hill down the street a little further. that has a 6,000 square foot home, a three-car garage, has a big practice. And I think I'm comparing myself to him because my practice is about a third or a fourth of that. And I said, great. Do you know this guy? Yes. Because I'm assuming it's a doctor. Who's this, is this male doctor, he said. And I said, so you know this guy? He said, do you know his family? Does he, does he have children? Does he have a wife? Yes. Does he have a son? Yes. How's his relationship with his wife? He said, well, that's interesting you ask. There's a lot of turmoil. There's, they think about divorces all the time, but they're still in there. But there's definitely a volatile uh, relationship. And what about his son? Does he play baseball? Are they involved? No, he's got problems. He's on drugs and they're having problems at school with him. And, you know, there's all kind of labels on him and they got him on medication and things like that. And I said, okay. And what about the, the yard? Well, they got people to take care of the yard. I don't even think they've noticed and Sometimes they drive on it. I said, what about the mother-in-law? Well, they got out of the country away from her. They didn't want to have her anywhere near it. She's a psycho, according to what they said. And what about the church? Are they involved in church? No, they don't. I don't think they can go to church. They're not very much into that. It just he's, he's focused on business. And I said, let me explain to you. If I gave you the opportunity to have his life, and you had to have his wife and his son 
and his uh, yard and his and, and duplicate that. And you could have his business success in there, but you had to have those things. Would you take it? He goes, now that I think about it, no. I wouldn't want to have that kind of craziness. And I said, let me explain to you. He doesn't have more success than you. He has success in his values, which is business and finance, and chaos in the other values. You have success in your values, which is family and spiritual, and aesthetics and baseball, but not in business and finance. He says, right, I don't put as many hours into that. I said, if you expect yourself as a cat to swim like a fish and expect to do well with that, it's not going to do well. He's a different person with a different set of values. His achievements are according to his values. Yours are according to yours. You don't have any less success than him. That's why I asked you, where are your success? You have just a different form of success. And when you finally realize your form is an expression of what your values are, you liberate yourself from the false expectations and envying of other people. That's incredible. I was really inspired by that story because sometimes you, it's there, but you cannot see it. Are we going to see you in Greece? I look forward to it. I definitely would love to come to Greece. I would love that. Thank you so much for your time. It was a great privilege to meet you.